Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, the first book of Timothy. You know, Timothy being a pastoral letter, Timothy was about 13 years old when Paul first came by, visiting him, his mother Eunice, and his grandmother Lois. And seven years later now, he comes back, and Timothy's a grown man. So he's writing him this pastoral letter telling him how a church should act and react and so forth. So it, it is doctrinal and pastoral and quite, a, quite a, uh, a lot of information telling us as Christians how to get along with, um, within the body itself. So having said that, the last chapter we, we were told of the mystery of Christ. And that mystery, of course, was from the foundation of this world. And that prepared you for this fourth chapter, which, um, which uh, you'll understand self-explanatory. Chapter 4, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Now the Spirit, naturally that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressedly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The, the, the word depart in the Greek is apostasy. The great apostasy will transpire. And naturally, when, when you have people that begin to listen too much to traditions of men, that makes void the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And what, what he's telling Timothy here is, um, I want you to, in the latter times, teach that people should expect this. And you know, it is really true. When you look at this world today, and when you see so many people doing bad things and calling it good, spiritual wars and blowing up little children, innocence, you know something is far wrong. Somebody's being led off the path expressedly as the Holy Spirit would speak, bringing truth to, to all mankind. So these seducing spirits, don't, don't think for a moment there are evil spirits in the earth. Uh, Satan, we have the Holy Spirit, and for every negative there is a positive. God also allows the evil spirit, but he gave us power over them. In Christ's name, you can order them out of your life. You don't have to put up with it. So you make a stand, you stand strong. But there are, I mean, people that will lead you astray if you listen to them. Well, how can I tell the difference? Well, are they teaching God's Word or man's Word? That's pretty easy to determine. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, um, many people lose uh, the meaning of being seared like you would sear a weapon before we had all the antibiotics and everything else. Many times you would, if you were in the field, you would have to sear a bad wound to stop the bleeding and everything else. But unfortunately, when you do that, it kills every nerve in that area. You got no feeling there any longer. And what he's saying here is your very conscience, your thought process, is seared with a hot iron. There's no feeling there. There's, there's uh, no conscience. You have no compassion. And um, certainly, Satan always ground, gains ground when people have no compassion. Always the mark of a Christian, especially one of God's elect, is they have compassion on people. They care. Verse 3, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 
Now, many times people have difficulty reading. Never let anybody, well, now where there are some groups that uh, if you're a divorcee, you cannot remarry. Well, it shows their ignorance of God's word. Number one, if you understand the law of our Father's word, there are reasons for divorce. And those reasons well recorded, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then, have you ever read uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8? God is a divorcee. He divorced Israel. Give her, I mean, wrote her out a bill of divorcement. You can read it for yourself, Jeremiah 3, verse 8. But Christ forgives. And it is true, if you do not repent, you should not remarry. But if you repent of all your sins, and God washes you white as snow and forgives you, you're a new person. Now, th this has to do with there are biblical reasons for divorce in that you can remarry. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you, and don't ever let anyone judge you on that. Because, why? Well, by God's word. Go by God's word, not traditions of men. Some, some people will make second-class citizens out of divorcees. That is not fair, and it is not right. Make them sit at the back of the church. How, how unfair can you be to teach a forgiving Christ? The fact that he forgives all sins, paid an awesome price on the cross. To, to pay for sins on repentance and then to say he doesn't have the power to do that. Now, there's a great deal more in that particular verse that you've got to be real careful commanding to abstain from meats. You shouldn't eat this or you shouldn't eat that, but, but that's not what it says. It says, which God hath created to be received. Don't let anyone judge you on that. God didn't create everything to be received. God made basically two classes of animal and bird and fish. Scavengers don't eat. Um, and otherwise, they're clean. So, and it is clean food. So, uh, no way have bodies changed since, you, since the beginning of time. Still the same flesh bodies, generation to generation, same health laws. God makes it very clear in Leviticus chapter 11 what you should and shouldn't eat. Now, this, this um, eating scavengers is, is not a sin to hell. It's a sin to your health. If you want to be healthy, you want to eat God's way. That's, that's why, why you pay attention to what your father, he created these bodies, he sent this letter of instructions along on how to keep them healthy and perking right along and doing pretty good, though we live in a polluted world. So uh, what, this is, what do you mean then with a scavenger? Okay, let's take, you got a little fish that's a sucker, called a sucker. He goes around on the bottom of everything and eats all the droppings and dead animals and all the germs and diseases, and he, he cleans the pond. He's a good animal for what he was created for. He keeps disease away from the good fish, okay. but you don't eat one of them. That's like taking your dirty air conditioner filter that's filtered your house and make you a cup of tea out of it. Okay. Likewise, what is a great stretch for many people is pork, then. Naturally, Leviticus says, of the pork you shall not eat. Why? Well, it has no sweat glands, except for just one or two in its nose. Well, where does the poison, you know, a human being, you've got sweat glands. If you get sick, you get a fever, and you sweat the poison out of your system. That's the way God made us. A, por a porky? He's created to cleanse the earth, and therefore he has no sweat glands, and therefore the poisons are stored in his fat. And naturally, that's why God said, hey, don't eat them. They will make you sick. Okay, And you, you go with that that has the split hoof and choose its could. But th those are God's health laws, and many are going to say, well, brother, you're just out of touch. Because Peter, in Acts chapter 10, was told by God when he brought three sheets down filled with scavengers and told Peter to eat. 
that he cleansed them. You would be a poor student of God's word if you felt that from that point. Just as those sheets were coming down from heaven and God was telling Peter to eat as he was on top of the house praying, Cornelius' people were at the front gate asking that Peter would come and teach them that they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They were Gentiles, called unclean or common before this time. It was not legal for one that served God to eat even with a, a Gentile, a commoner. So God is doing a little lesson here concerning the scavengers with people. What did he say there? Let's, what was the whole message of that? If you think that was what it was, you find the answer in the 28th chapter. After the sheet went up three times, Peter, he still said, I'm not going to eat that stuff. Then finally Cornelius' people show up and, and speak of the angel that sent them here sooner or later. And then Peter states in the 28th verse, and this is the answer. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is not, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, that's to socialize, or come unto one of another nation, that's, that's ethnicity, where our word ethnicity, ethnics, comes from. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And not, not animals. We're not talking about something to eat. God was making a point to Peter that you don't call uh, anyone. And uh, alus in the Greek is different. Pule is a race or kindred. You do not call them common, whoever they are. If they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a Christian. Okay, That's what that was all about. It was not cleansing food. So back again to the fourth chapter, don't let anyone judge you in marriage or don't let anyone judge you in eating meats that God created to be received. And again, I'll give you the key. All you got to do is read Leviticus 11 and it'll give the list there that you should and shouldn't eat if you want to be healthy. So um, there we, it's, it's too bad that people um, miss, do not teach God's word of health and understanding as well as spiritual. Explicitly, he says in verse 1, teach this. Now, here again is where it throws a lot of people. They take this fourth verse. Verse 4, let's read it. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And people will say, well, see right there, God made it possible that every creature is good. Didn't say good to eat. It's good for the purpose God created it for. Okay. That's, that is what the subject is. Every creature that's being one created of God is good. God doesn't create bad stuff. He created bad stuff for you to eat. But you see, that bad stuff that you're not supposed to eat keeps disease off of humanity. It cleanses the world. That's what it was created for, and that is good. For the purpose God created it, that's good. Now, this is something everybody must make their own mind up about and, uh, and choose their own path. And, but I, as a teacher of God's Word, and understanding the manuscripts, I'm going to teach it the way it's written on every quarter. If you want to be healthy, God created these bodies. He sent this book of instructions on how to handle them. You know, a lot of people, if they get some big uh, house object that must be put together, they were sent a bill of instructions on steps to use, and they throw that away and start throwing stuff together, and they end up with a bunch of leftovers, and that's the way they do their own life. They don't read this letter of instruction on how to keep the body healthy, and how to be pleasing to Almighty God, whereby you receive His blessings. That's important. 
So there you have it. Uh, always remember Acts chapter 10, verse 28, when you read that verse. Uh, verse 5, let's continue on. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. In other words, by the word of God and prayer and study of the word, you know what is and what isn't. Verse 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourisheth up, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. In other words, if you will stick with this, if you will stand by it, if your character will not bend one way or the other, never, you know, you do not teach God's Word to offend anyone, but to correct, to bring health, to bring the good news, to bring the letter from God, and never make any apology for it, because it is your Heavenly Father's Word. And His doctrine, you want to be a good minister, you want to be one that is able to plant seeds to your neighbors and so on and so forth, go by God's Word. It makes you a good citizen. It, it makes you out uh, stand out in the community. Your own dignity and your reputation is helped there. Verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, you know, women sure get a bad rap sometimes by interpreters without explaining the full thing. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with old wives' fables, and I'm familiar with old husbands' fables also. There's a difference. If you listen to the man's fables, do you know they grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger? Women's fables usually pretty well, the old wives' fables pretty well stay the same. But men's, they grow and get greatness to them, you know? So uh, always document things. It's real easy to document them in the Word of God and find out what saith the Father. For he's the one that made these things, knows how to get along, and what he expects from us if you want his blessings, okay? Uh, verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, uh, bodily exercise is fantastic. It keeps your body healthy. Uh, but compared to exercising your mind in the Father's Word, makes you much stronger. It gives you character. It, it gives you knowledge and wisdom and understanding. It gives you the doctrine of Almighty God, whereby you can attain freedoms from doctrines, freedoms from traditions of men that will bind you and make prisoners out of you by false teaching. You know, learn the truth and the truth will set you free from crackpots, okay? from false teachers, from fables, when you have the actual word of God in his gentleness and in his kindness. God's word is always gentle, when it should be gentle and it's firm, when it should be firm, and it is certainly corrective when you have to practice tough love. It's all part of God's Word to its completeness. Verse 9, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. It's just, it's just good. Exercise your mind. Keep it working. Verse 10, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. How many was that again? All men, especially of those that believe. When you believe, you automatically, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son that whomsoever would believe upon him would not perish but have eternal life. That word eternal, is, it means exactly that. God is not the God of the dead. In other words, you exist from the first earth age through this one and the one to come. 
God is not the God of the dead. Satan isn't even dead yet. I think if you've lived very long, you can document that. <clears throat> but he will at the end of that great 20th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Verse 11. These things command and teach. <clears throat> In other words, you hold, excuse me, you hold a firm line, and this is what you teach. And you know something? If you teach and practice God's word, you're going to have God's blessings. You know, some people say, well, God never does anything for me. I wonder why. Well, I can tell you. Do you ever read his letter? Do you ever live by it? Kind of, you know, at least I, I know we're not perfect and I know we all fall short. But if you make a good effort, God's going to bring you happiness. God's going to bless your life. And... Um, and I believe that many people have a destiny and a purpose, as it is written in this great word of God's election. And they have duties to do, and they've known since there was a child there was more to God's word than they had been taught. And they hang in there, and they let build that character. They exercise that mind, and they absorb that truth. And they're not afraid to share it. Okay, Verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. Now, Timothy was only about, what, 20 or 21. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word. Well, how can you do that in word? You learn it. You exercise your mind in it. Then you're ready. Timothy was. He had two good teachers besides Paul. He had, he had Eunice and he had Lois, his mother and grandmother. His father is never mentioned. In conversation, in other words, you, you keep that conversation going. You gain in it. In charity, that is to say love of the community, of your neighbors. In spirit, that is to say in the Holy Spirit, let the unction and spiritual discernment come into you whereby you know what is right when you hear it and, and, uh, and what is wrong. Without uh, just, it is just your ability with that spiritual discernment to know. You can meet somebody and in five minutes, you got them pretty well figured out, you know, because you can witness their spirit. That spirit comes forth. And then plus that love in spirit, test that spirit in faith. Always let your faith be strong. You can count on God. Everything he has ever said or taught has come to pass exactly as it's written. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes. It always comes to pass as the word says it will if you know how to read it, if you understand it. Therefore, God's not going to lead you down Primrose Lane. He's always going to take care of you. But... What, what Paul is saying here, and, and you know, you remember back um, in a prior chapter, he said, um, it was verse 6 of chapter 3, not a novice. That means somebody that just comes into the Word and said, I'm going to start teaching. Well, you're not ready. Okay. Well, but Timothy <clears throat> had at least seven years. And probably more than that, quite frankly, if the truth was known. He was 13 when Paul came by the first time, but I think Lois and Eunice probably had him going a long time before that. And then seven years later, he has studied. And it wouldn't be natural that many elders, when a 21-year-old came by and was teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and line by line, they're going to, they would maybe try to use his youth but not his experience. You, you want to listen to what someone says, a man, woman, child, and you'll always learn something. What you learn may be, be hey, don't ever listen to that character again. And, and you, don't, you always check a man out, this man or any other man. What does the Word say? That's what you go by is what God has to say. So don't let people judge you whether you're young, in between, or old. But do be ready. If you're going to start teaching, be prepared to teach. Well, many, you know, I get many letters will say, well, how, how can I tell when I'm ready to teach? I, I can tell you, it will be when people approach you 
they get acquainted with you and they know you have answers and people will travel from far to get their questions answered and they will ask you and when you can answer those questions then people want to hear you and when people want to hear you you're ready okay god has blessed you you have it and nobody knows exactly what it is until you hear it and you know whether it's of god or if it's man okay man should never build a reputation for himself first comes well, let's take this church as an example, Shepherd's Chapel. What does that mean? Well, there's one shepherd. It's Christ. He's the head. And people will say, well, how can I join your church? I don't, I don't talk to him. Talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the boss. And if he accepts you, where you're going to, you're in. But he truly, he keeps all the church letters in heaven in the book of life. We don't keep church letters here at the chapel. They're, they're in heaven, right in the book of life. It's written down every day. If you do something wrong, it makes, it makes headlines there in the book of life. Or if you repent, it's erased and it goes away, never to be heard from again. Your good deeds, they kind of stack up there. And as we learn here in this book of Timothy before too long, in the... Um, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, along about verse 8 or 9, good deeds cover a multitude of sins. We'll get that in the next book. Okay. So they kind of stay there, and, and God likes that. Okay. But there you have it, and how precious it is to be still. Don't let somebody judge you by what you are. Your credentials are your ability. Uh, you know, you could have a list that long behind your name, DD of this and DD of that and BS of this and BS of that. and It means nothing. It's your ability. This is why Christ said, uh, you answer this and if you do, I will tell you so and so. It was his ability. And so it is with you. When you're ready, you're ready and uh, never um, uh, let someone take advantage of your age to document what you know, let your word that you're teaching document that, and so it is. Okay, let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 13, and you, you keep that going. Keep it pure, the impurity. Don't, don't drag in any extra stuff. 13, till I come, give attendance to reading. That means publicly you read the word and publicly and privately you study it, but read it out loud to the people. Well, read what, brother? The word of God, of course. To exhortation, that means when somebody needs correction or ask a question that be able to exhort, that is to say, tell them how to get it done. To doctrine. And don't ever take on man's doctrine that makes void the Word of God. We have one doctrine, that is the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles and the prophets and those He sent. And, and, um, and, and so it is. What, uh, and um, God sends apostles. Well, what is an apostle? It's a sent one. That's what the word means. And certainly... Timothy was, and so was Paul. But stick to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. In other words, uh, God gives gifts. and uh, Different gifts, different people. It's... Um, the word gift in the Greek many times is chariz. It's charisma. And people recognize that. But uh, don't neglect it. You know something? Many, no gift is given by God that he's going to take back. If God gives a gift, it means that he has a purpose for you. And as it is written in Romans chapter 11, no gift is given with repentance. He's not going to take it away. He's going to straighten your case out until you get it right. And when you fall short, 
and that gift is still going to stand, it, it, will, it will come out. There's nothing you can do about it. If God gives you that gift of teaching or sharing truth or whatever, it's going to come out because it's God-given. And that is true charisma. Don't ever neglect the gift God gives you. Verse 15, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. I mean, don't, don't just part way. That thy profiting may appear to all. And, and so it is, your progress can be made known to everybody. They can see your progress of God bringing you forward. This word meditate, what does it mean? Well, the etymology of the word comes from could. It comes from a cow chewing her cud, or a deer, or a clean animal. See, a cow has more stomach than one, and while the sun's out and they're chomping, they bring in that foliage, and then they go lay down somewhere, and they send that cud down into that tummy, and up comes that cud, and they chew it and chew it. They meditate on it. That's what he means. What you have taken in in the day, stop, think, meditate, chew that cud. Wall it over, consider it, think about it. What it really has to do is um, think for yourself. Don't let somebody else do your thinking. Do you know that's how you get tied up in cults? Is when, when they do your thinking for you. When, when some group, if you join some group and they want to do all your thinking for you, instead of teaching you how to think for yourself, you, you better be very careful because you're in a cult. God wants you to be a free thinker, to think for yourself, to make your own decision. Do you know why? On Judgment Day, you're going to stand before Almighty God. There's not going to be some preacher or some church or something else between you and Him. You're going to answer for your actions. And it's none of this business of, well, I would have done it, but so-and-so said. No, He sent you a letter that you can read. And there, there are... There are, um, in God's way, understanding for handicapped and other people that are unable to. But he does it. Okay, one more verse here. Let's go uh, with uh, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. That's the teachings. Continue in them. You stay firm. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. In other words, you're going to save souls, and that's what Christ was in the business of, God's Savior. That's what Yeshua in the Hebrew tongue means. That's what Jesus in English means as Father's Savior. So there you have it. That's what the Word does. It builds you up. It gives you character. It gives you discipline. Without discipline, you're in a heap of hurt. You must discipline yourself in the Word. All right, we'll pick it up here in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's Word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about some reverend, some denomination, or some organization. We do not judge people. Our Father does the judging. All you do is spiritually discern what you should hear and what you should not, and you stay true to the Word of God. You'll be doing just great. 
Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need that number and you don't need an address. Why? Father is a mind reader. In the Greek, it's cardio noir. He knows your heart and mind. You don't even have to say it out loud. You know, he created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Fingerprints different. Why? He wanted someone exactly like you, but he does want you to love him. That comes with it. If you love him, he already loves you. He may not love what you're doing, but he does love you. And that pays great dividends because that's what he wants from you. As a matter of fact, he says in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your love. That's grace, your unmerited favor, mercy. And so it is. Let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Amen. All right. Uh, question and answer time here. And we're going to go with, um, who are we got here? We got Maria from Illinois. Um, I, I love watching your program since I'm only 10 and I can't really understand the Bible. Thank you for taking time to explain it to my family and I. My questions are, is it all right to light candles and say prayers to pictures of family members that have passed? You don't, don't make prayers um, to the picture, but to the Father for that family member, okay? You're, you're doing okay. I'm just helping you to express it. You always pray to the Father, not to a picture, okay? That's, uh, I, and we always love our loved ones that have gone on, grandparents and so forth. That's beautiful. But pray to the Father for that family member. That's good. That's, uh, that's all right. Also, is there such a thing as ghost? Is there a good children's Bible that my mom can read to my sisters and I? We are seven, eight, and 10 years old. Well, Maria, thank you for writing. God bless you. We have a children's book. It's God's Natural Way. And uh, I, it's a good work that helps explain the truths really of the Bible. And you'll see it uh, when you either call or write on the book list, okay? And um, as far as are there ghosts, there are spirits, and there are some that are evil spirits. There are, the word demon um, is, um, is, is an evil spirit. But God, Christ gave you power in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. He gives you power over all your enemies, including Satan and evil spirits. So you being 10, you have the right to exercise that power, that authority to drive anything negative away from you. Thanks for writing. Thanks for studying. Uh, Sheila from Newfoundland. When our family and friends comes to us to deliver us up to Satan's synagogue for those, for those 10 days, is it possible for me to take a shower and pack my bags before leaving home? I'm not sure what I could be doing at that time. I would like to be clean and fresh. You are already, beloved. And in spirit, you are so fresh that you're ready for any time, any moment, any day. Don't you worry about it. All right, you're doing good. Thank you for Newfoundland. Tracy from Arkansas. Why is it that we Christians don't pray for guidance when we are a, in a, have a physical condition and a part of our body and we act on our own, we pray for a successful operation, and the procedure doesn't come out just right, then we pray for God's blessings and healing. For example, I have a pinky on my left hand that was curling in toward my palm, contracting. I had it operated on, and after physical therapy, it was still curling a bit along with my ring finger. The ring finger went from size 9 to size 11, and both knuckles were and are still sore and swollen. Now I ask for healing. My question is in the first sentence. Well, you know, you want to always remember, this is where health laws that we were talking about earlier really come into play. Christ can heal many people, and if you still, you don't, you don't eat what he tells you to eat, if you eat garbage scavengers, you're going to be sick. 
you're going to be ill. It's just, it's just that way. God can heal you, and if you don't follow God's health laws, how can you be healthy? So that goes along with it, all right? And then, you know, these flesh bodies are not perfect. They get old, they wither, and just think and look, mainly look forward to that time soon when we all put on those spiritual bodies that don't age, they don't get old, they don't have pain, and um, it's, going, it's, it's good to look forward to. But in the flesh, because of a polluted world, we have, we have a lot of problems, but just hang tough and, and know. Feed that old body the way it is. God, you know, he put it together pretty good. He gave us fingerprints so we can reach down and we can pick something up and it doesn't just slide out. You know, the fingerprints hold it. He put hair on the back of our hand so if I get that in a close place, I feel it and I move it, you know, because he planned all this out and he created pretty good old bodies, I'll tell you for sure. But we have a better one. It's our spiritual body and it dwells within this thing until this one passes away. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The air of that old clay pot breaks. That means this body dies. The silver cord parts. That means the soul, your being, leaves in that spiritual body and returns instantly to the Father that gave it. Uh, Linda from New York. Please tell me if I understand this verse the right way. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, but as a, it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Question, does this mean God will give his understanding of his word to people only who have his spirit in them? Um, you don't have to share this part. I'm going to, just sure as the world, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm seeing second opinion, I'm seeing second opinion, a person asking my meaning of this verse above is the answer I give. Another pastor said I was incorrect with my answer. You are correct. Not only does the Father, you know, he gives you the mystery that we covered in yesterday's lecture. The mystery of God's word, whereby you understand the first earth age, this one and the one that's coming. And you know what God expects us to do. And that sure, you can't imagine the beauty of knowing and understanding God's word, of having God's touch. And not to mention what it's going to be like in the new earth age when the firmament goes back out where it is and the earth is back on its uh, correct axis. And 90 magnetic north and true north will be right, right on instead of 90 miles apart. We get a little wobble here jet stream and other things, all done away with. And what a perfect world it's going to be, the same from the North Pole to the South, according to God's Word. Um, Kathy from Ohio, will there be an actual physical temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem before the Antichrist arrives on earth de facto or during the tribulation? Not necessarily. It's certainly not the tabernacle or temple we're interested in. The temple now is that temple Christ said, you destroy this tabernacle, I can rebuild it in three days. It means when he resurrected from that tomb in three days, he built the many-membered body and he is the head, the cap cornerstone, don't reject him. And the many-membered body of Christians around the world today make up that temple, that many-membered body. And that is what does God's work when Christ sits at the right hand of the God until his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think put the enemies at the footstool? God's elect do, God's children. Charlie from Michigan, thank you for, you're welcome. Pastor Murray, what, what year does the planet Saturn come out of the constellation Virgo, and what does that mean in Bible prophecies? Well, we can't say that it means anything in Bible prophecies, but we do know that Virgo is the virgin, and from that comes the branch, Shemak, which is to say Christ. And we do know that Saturn is always counted as Satan's planet, and right now in a little racetrack right in Virgo, that planet, Satan's planet, is on a track until December the December 2012. And it seems like a lot of things are pointing to December 2012. 
what will happen on December 2012? Well, 2012 will come to pass. And whatever God expects of us, we're going to be ready. We're going to keep plowing until he says go. So don't look for anything. I know many people say, well, the Mayan calendar runs out then. Well, you, maybe you don't understand the Mayan cal calendar. Maybe it ends a phase and then starts back. Okay. And I'm not taking away from the Mayan calendar. They knew the planet alignment that happens this December 2012. It's awesome. <clears throat> the knowledge that they possessed even back at that time. Uh, but, but, you know, the thing we are, we are watchmen. And what you do is you keep watching and knowing the signs and seasons and um, test the temperature. Jerusalem is always our barometer. Okay. Penny from Michigan, why does God allow certain people to get married and not others? What would be the cause of not receiving the blessing of marriage? Thank you. Well, Penny, you know what, probably what? Probably God didn't make a man good enough for you. Maybe, um, maybe um, you'll find a man maybe someday that is good enough for you. Until then, we know you just let God handle those type things, and, and so it is. Um, really, always kind of look for, you can always, if, you, if you're truly looking for marriage, find it in the right place, uh, usually. Um, so many people get a little desperate and they might decide, well, I'll just go out to the local bar to maybe meet some people. <laughs> Who do you think you're going to meet down there? It would be like maybe if you wanted to meet somebody you could fellowship with that you would go down to the occupiers on Wall Street today. Maybe I can meet somebody down there that I can fellowship with. Well, I don't know. There's rape and there's drugs and all. I, I believe a wise person wouldn't go there because it's a no-no. Um, so you use good judgment. You meet where you meet the type of people wherever you go that are there. Okay, and then you're careful. Denise from Georgia. My question is, Mary. <clears throat> excuse me. Mary was a virgin when she was expecting Jesus. How did Joseph and the other people react when she told them she was with child? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 20? And um, it, it tells you how Joseph reacted. Because he was, he was betrothed to her, and he heard that she was, and presto, in that 20th verse, an angel appears. Tell them, don't you worry about it. And Joseph, being a man of God himself, didn't. He listened to the angel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Keith from Arizona. Where did dinosaurs come from? What's going to happen to hell when it's all said and done? Okay, two questions. Dinosaurs, where did they come from? God created them. God loves animals, but he created them in the first earth age. You might say, well, why would he do that? Well, much of our pet petrol, petroleum today comes from that, um, from times past. And the point is, God loves animals, and they're here. Now, you, you might say, here's, here's one from Alaska. That's a tooth of um, a dinosaur rex, which you can see, this is a meat eater. Boy, he can tear you up real good with, with those teeth. This is one tooth. That's from Alaska, and um, here is a mammoth tooth from Texas. This is tooth ivory right here, flat and level because he, he partook of legumes. He was not a meat eater. So God created all types of animals even in the first age, scavengers and, and clean. So he, he, loves his, uh, he loves his animals. And they're going to be with us in the eternity as well. When you read uh, Isaiah chapter 11, only they're all spiritual also that are with us. Now, what happens when hell is over? Well, according to the first verse of the very next chapter, when the second death t uh, takes place, which is to say going to hell, the lake of fire, all lakes are done away with, which means hell is done away with. The lake of fire is simply 
you want to really understand our Father. As it's written in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12, He is a consuming fire. And um, when heaven is there, there's not going to be a bunch of people burning forever and ever and we be in heaven. Won't that be wonderful? That you, you go to heaven and there you got people screaming and yelling and forever and ever. No, that, there, it's covered over as it's written in Revelation 21 verse 1. The earth, it will say a new earth, but the word in the Greek is rejuvenated. This one, it's going to be kept right here. That's why you can rest assured there's not going to be any holocaust, atomic. God intends to come here and set his capital up as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 16, right on Mount Zion. Mary from West Virginia, where in the Bible does it say how old we will be in heaven? Well, it, it doesn't say how old, but we, you, you um, gain knowledge by observing what is reported, what is written. Every angel that appeared, let's say to Mary Magdalena, let's say to those two that went to the tomb and the rock was open and he rolled back and they were standing there, they were young people. Why? Because in spiritual bodies, we're all the same age. There is no such thing as age. It, you, uh, for the eons of time, spiritual bodies do not age. They are um, naturally appear young because age means nothing. They are all adult, and so it is. That's the way God created us. Sean from, I don't know where Sean's from. It, the father does. Is the tree of life in Genesis symbolic of Jesus Christ? Well, he's, he is the trunk and the limbs the one that gives us life, eternal life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is Satan. You know, it documents this in more places than one. The tree of life being Christ. When you accept him, God would even say in the great book of Isaiah, his children are his plantings, his trees that he's planted. And he is their Ishai, which is to say in the Hebrew, husband. Uh, Rita from Wisconsin, I was told by my brother that Abel was the serpent's son and, and my, my brother that Abel was the serpent's son and not Adam's son. Is this true? Well, your brother, Abel was Adam's son. Now, if you want to talk about Cain, that's a little different story. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 35 forward, lets us know the good seed was planted by Almighty God, planted through the natural way. But Satan came along in the night and planted a seed wicked that shouldn't have been here. And this is why God would say in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to the serpent, which is Satan, okay? That's one of Satan's names. I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. You're going to bruise his heel, and he did. He nailed him to the cross. But he is going to bust your gourd, meaning he's going to crush your head. That happens at the end of Revelation 20. But he's, your brother kind of has the sons crossed up there. Abel was a good child. Cain was not. He murdered him. And, and you, Jesus, again, would identify him as Satan's child in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, when he was talking to some people. He said, you, your father was the first murderer. Well, who was that? Well, it was Cain, of course. And his father was the devil. That's why the seed was placed as it was written in 315 Genesis. That's part of the mystery of the kingdom that has been kept secret since the foundation of the world. As Matthew chapter 13, verse 35, the words from Christ's mouth spoken. The word foundation in the Greek is katabo, which it means overthrow. That means when Satan was overthrown in the first earth age. Roland from Michigan, what is the difference between a heavenly host and a spirit? Thank you. Well, a spirit is singular. A host is many, 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 okay? A host means a great, large crowd. So a heavenly host is a large crowd of angels. 
What does the word angel mean? It means messenger. Okay. And what were you before you came here? Well, you were in spirit body, which that's what call, people call angels. And that's why people don't marry in the third earth age, because they're in spiritual bodies. But a spirit is singular. It can be man's spirit, or it can be the Holy Spirit, or it can be Satan's spirit. Man can use his spirit for whatever he chooses. He can follow God's word and let his spirit go out to help people, assist people, show compassion. Or some people will take the spirit of Satan and injure people, hurt people, uh, and only think of self. So uh, there, there are many spirits in the world, and unfortunately, sometimes people partake of too many spirits in a bottle. And that will affect your spirit until it'll go crazy for a while. So you, you always utilize common sense. Doris from Mississippi. Where in the Bible does it say that Christ's kingdom will be on earth? Also, is he coming down to us or are we going up to him? We're, he's coming down. Okay, It's written in many, many places. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 16, Almighty God made an eternal covenant with Mount Zion as his favorite place. And uh, Revelation chapter 21 declares that Christ will establish his heaven on earth. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word. But you know what's most important? God loves you for it. It's the letter he sent to you. And when, when you read that letter and when you study it to feel the emotions of God, it makes his day. Boy, when he makes his, when you make his day, is he ever going to make yours? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. And bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word, even with trouble, it's still a good day because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.